Well, the theory is to challenge uh, the Commerce Clause power of Congress um, with a Tenth Amendment spin. Um, what the bill says, the, is now the law in Montana, is that any firearms, ammunition, and firearms accessories made and retained in Montana are simply not subject to any federal jurisdiction under the power of Congress to regulate commerce among the states. In addition to the federal tax escrow account, Bills are popping up that put a freeze on federal taxes and pay them to the IRS based upon federal compliance to state resolutions and state legislation. These are peaceful and viable solutions to federal abuses. Um, the bill that I'm working on right now, and I've actually got a meeting with uh, a member of the uh, House Judiciary Committee uh, next week, plan to actually look at this legislation and try to make it consistent with Kansas statute, uh, will take federal tax receipts that are gathered on individuals in the state of Kansas and on corporations that do business in the state of Kansas uh, would, instead of sending those directly to the IRS, would in instead send them to the Kansas Department of Revenue. What they would look at is, is the proportion of federal spending that satisfies enumerated powers and what percentage does not. Whatever percentage does not satisfy enumerated powers, the state of Kansas will utilize to satisfy unfunded mandates on the part of the federal government. Whatever is left over goes back to the people of Kansas. We have the ability to tell the federal government to get out, so it's just a lot easier. Once you inform your state as to what the Tenth Amendment is, Ninth and Tenth Amendment is, and how they can say no to the federal government, once you talk to your representatives about that, once they get educated, then they start to go, okay, there is a solution to this problem. We can do this all by ourselves as an individual state. HJR 88 literally enumerates many of the infractions that have been made by the federal government and basically says that from the time of its enacting, from the time that our Missouri state constitution would be amended as a result in, of the passage and then voter approval of House Joint Resolution 88, uh, that the state of Missouri would never again be compelled to adhere, to adhere to or even recognize any law that comes from the federal government that is not constitutional. It is a message that I hope that the General Assembly in Missouri sends to its federal delegation in Washington, D.C., saying as the elected representatives uh, at the state level, the people that are your constituents also, that you understand uh, we are sending a message for you to cease and desist. You also have a direct infringement into state sovereignty um, when you start talking about our monetary policy. Um, our, you know, it was left to the uh, to the to the pow the uh, Congress to be able to coin money, to, and um, and you know they delegated that responsibility out to a, a group of private bankers. And uh, you know we see that in uh, in Article One, Section Ten, that the, that the states are required to only accept gold and silver as legal tender. Uh, well, when you've delegated the authority out to to print money uh, by a uh, federal entity, well, actually, it's not even a federal entity, a private entity doing so under the auspices of a federal entity. What you've done is uh, you've infringed, you've, you've basically made criminal organizations out of the states because they can't conduct their transactions in the gold and silver that they're required to under Article One, Section Ten. In addition to state resolutions that put a freeze on federal taxes, comes an electronic gold system that would increase the gold tax base. Well, the, the money bill I originally drafted was for New Hampshire, and it was based on the use of electronic gold currency, mainly because that's the cutting-edge technology now. Uh, but you could, at the present time, make it gold and silver because they've expanded that technology. But what essentially did was to have the state adopt as an alternative currency this electronic gold system. And in that particular case, it was to uh, a, sm a relatively small percentage of the state's budget because we tied it to the tobacco tax, make it simple, and not scare people too much. We're not going to jump into the lake with both feet. We're just going to put our toes in, as it were. About 10% of the state's budget would come in in gold, and then the state would offer to pay out gold to whichever its creditors, to whomever it owed money, first come, first served. We'll pay that debt in gold. Now, the thought was, I, I think it's fair, that pretty soon that 10% of the state's revenue in gold would be out the door. People would be lining up to get that. Then the treasurer would come back to the legislature and say, you know what happened here? Our gold stock went to zero in a matter of a month. I need to have more of the tax base turned into gold. 
have increased the gold tax base. And if it's correct that good money will eventually prevail over bad money, you would see most of that state economy, the state spending, would be on a gold basis. And then in the private economy, well, people are receiving gold from the state and people are having to pay gold into the state for taxes. What about in the middle here? Well, now I'm going to start asking people to pay me in gold or I'm going to start offering to pay the gold that I've received to people. And it would expand through the private economy. And the next thing you know, that state for all intents and purposes would be off the Federal Reserve System. Federal Reserve notes would be like a foreign currency, like euros or something. Right? You'd only take them when you needed to deal with somebody out of that state that demanded to be paid in Federal Reserve notes. And the other state... People in other states would be looking at this and saying, hey, why aren't we dealing in gold? The federal government, the American government is weak because it doesn't have a big army, a big navy, high taxes like a European power. And Jefferson said, no, this is exactly our strength. Americans love their government because it doesn't do anything to them. Right. But over time, as the judge was saying earlier, we've come to have this opposite model where now it seems that the government is, is able to decide how much you get paid, who your doctor is going to be, whether you can buy a gun, what you can, anything it wants to. Well, if the states had as little power back then as they have today, nobody would have agreed with the Constitution. It seems like it's crept in slowly with people who started with a pure and noble desire to have a centralized government. And they've been encroaching on the rights of the states year by year, bit by bit, law by law, and nobody in the states woke up enough to say, uh-uh, that's too much. So what we're doing in Missouri is we're drawing the line in the sand and we're saying this is our territory, that is your territory. The Constitution says that this is our right. And unless we take back what was already given to us, we're not going to get any respect from them. More than 35 states have already declared sovereignty or in the process of declaring sovereignty against the federal government. And that doesn't mean that they seceded as the national corporate media uh, spins it. They're simply stating, look, federal government, you're not supposed to be involved uh, in local education. You're not supposed to be involved in local environmental rules. You're not supposed to be involved running and controlling our local police departments. Jefferson makes a point that he actually took from Locke. He says, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So there's the key to it, that people can put up with a lot, and probably they should put up with a lot, of friction in the system, simply because the alternative of overthrowing a government with everything that that entails is potentially so horrendous that we don't want to get involved in that. But when it reaches the stage that you can look at what's going on and say, well, this is just a series of usurpations, abuses, which are leading inexorably to this result, then... It is not simply one's right, it is your duty to take this kind of action. The American people have read the Bill of Rights, they've read the Constitution, they've read their state Bill of Rights and Constitutions, and they figured out everything the federal government is doing is illegal and out of control and wrong. And so we're in the right, not just in the right, it's our duty to stand up and say no and declare states' rights under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment that is enshrined in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence talks about the uh, proper role of government. And right after it talks about um, the unalienable rights that we were blessed with, with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it states what government is for. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And that's the bottom line. We are here to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If your federal government isn't doing that, then the people, as the Declaration of Independence says, the people have the right and the duty to throw off such government and establish new guards for uh, the future of our security and happiness. It is altogether fitting this be done.